As the Case-Shiller Index turns over and home prices across the nation begin crashing, you might be wondering what cities will suffer the most. Everyone knows that the real estate market is very regional. In every crash throughout history, there have been massive differences in severity depending on the location. Take for an example 2008, the worst real estate crash in our lifetimes. Back then, prices on a national level crashed by 27.3%. To put that into perspective, that means a house that cost $250,000 at the peak of the bubble will cost $182,000 post-crash. Quite a steep discount, all things considered, but not something you would view as a fatal blow. When people recall the 08 crash, they think of prices falling much worse than that, and this is because this number was the national average. It did not capture the true carnage that was happening in dozens of major cities throughout the United States. In 2008, we had many regions suffer collapses significantly worse than this. The number one example to showcase as an extreme is Las Vegas. Vegas in the early 2000s was a hotspot that saw prices rise. 233% from January of 2000 to July 2006. Now I know we're talking about the past here, but I just want to make this point before we move forward. At this spot right here, the market began crashing following what seems to be a full year of parabolic growth. Once the crash had started, it would continue to fall all the way until March 2012. After nearly six years of price declines, we finally reached the bottom, which resulted in that specific market crashing 62%. That means the same $250,000 house at peak level we talked about earlier would cost $95,000 post-crash, a massive difference when compared to the national average. This situation and glimpse into history shows you exactly what is possible when we look at individual inflated markets during a downturn. Things can look very different city by city and the national average is only a peek into the real story happening on the ground. So now that we understand the crash can look very different depending on where you're looking, let's take a glimpse into the current crash. We know that today, investors face a dilemma. The Fed is going through a phase of aggressive monetary tightening and Bank of America just predicted 0% returns from stocks next year. 0%. Restructuring your portfolio has never been more difficult or more crucial. So where can you turn? Well, you all know that I've been advocating for alternatives for years, and they've done pretty well for me, and it seems like people are catching up. Both JP Morgan and BlackRock recently announced they'll be deploying a strategy. Tara, there are reasonable alternatives. In light of this new normal, certain platforms have arisen, giving access to top alternative asset classes. There's one in particular that seems like a no-brainer to me. In fact, I invest with them myself. It's called Masterworks. This isn't crypto or NFTs. These are physical paintings from legends like Picasso. UBS reports the ultra wealthy are spending double what they did last year on fine art in part to diversify and because it's a natural inflation hedge according to city masterworks buys this fine art and qualifies it with the sec splitting it into shares for investors i've linked to their offerings page on sec.gov down below as well now if masterworks sells your painting for a profit it can mean money back in your pocket and even in 2022 as the stock market has its worst performance in 50 years masterworks has sold seven paintings their last sale in November was for a 13.9% net return to their investors. That brings Masterworks' last three sales to 13, 17, and 21% net returns. Masterworks' offerings have sold out in less than an hour before, but you'll get priority access with the link below. Now back to the housing market and how it differs city by city. While nationally the case shiller is only down about 2.3%, we can already spot these huge differences in countless markets throughout the US. These cities are what many call the post 2020 boomtown, where a perfect storm of variables combine to push prices into the stratosphere. Now as things begin to turn, we are already seeing a massive divergence from the national average, just like in 2008. Seattle is currently leading the pack. It was well known that Seattle was a region stuffed with speculation and massive price growth. Following the crash of 2008, home values there grew 316%. This means that a person who bought in February of 2012 for $200,000 could have sold their home earlier this year for approximately $632,000, while growth prior to 2020 was already getting out of hand, as you just saw with that example. You can see right here on the chart, it simply goes parabolic. The line quite literally looks to be going straight up. 
In fact, from October 2021 to May 2022, prices jumped 20%. This is simply unheard of in the real estate world, and a large reason is a combination of unprecedented demand coupled with tight inventory. One quick look at Redfin stats, and you can see that in the time period following February 2020, the medium time a house in Seattle was sent on the market was seven days. These are some of the lowest numbers in the country, and if you look at inventory levels, you can see why houses were moving this fast. There simply just wasn't enough for sale. Numbers dipped to record lows before bottoming out in January of 2022. The inventory shortage nationwide was significant, but here it was record-breaking. From top to bottom, Seattle saw an 85% reduction in the number of houses for sale. And as always, simple economics tells us price is a function of supply and demand. Now you may hear this and say to yourself, well, this doesn't sound like a bubble. It sounds like legitimate market factors pushed the Seattle area up in a way that reflected genuine demand created by real people and low interest rates. And while that's partially true, the real story is that the Seattle housing market bubble followed another bubble. The Seattle tech bubble. We know that post 2020, many of these high flying tech stocks that were headquartered or at least present right here in this city saw their stock values explode. This enriched plenty of workers who had equity via employee ESPP plans or specialty bonuses. Now that the vast majority of these tech giants are in downswings to the point that they're laying people off, it's affecting housing demand in a way that we haven't seen since 2008. According to local news reports, the number of tech company layoffs this year in the Seattle area is nearing levels from the Great Recession circa 2008. And this corresponds with the value drops we are seeing right now. Inventory levels are jumping back up, and price drops among listings have become a regular occurrence. We see the same type of action in other tech cities as well. San Francisco has seen inventory levels jumped 51% year over year. Austin, Texas jumped 160%, Portland 75%, and Phoenix 175%. The list goes on and on and the pattern is clear. In expensive cities, especially those with heavy tech presence, we are seeing a massive influx of inventory and historically this is exactly what you see prior to massive downswings. We know from Bill McBride's research that in almost every case throughout history, it's inventory that tells the story. He came up with this graph that looks at the relationship between prices and supply, and without boring you to death, what you see is this. As the number of homes for sale grows, which is displayed on the left y-axis, the tendency for prices to drop increases. For example, if you have 12 months of inventory, which is near record-breaking, what tends to follow is massive decreases in the Case-Shiller Index, which tracks prices nationally. Now the problem many analysts encounter is that they're too optimistic when using this chart. You see, because of 2020 and things that happened with the Fed and what followed in the aftermath, this chart is starting to get less reliable, and this is very important to understand. Stand. We are now seeing more extreme movements that don't correlate to historic norms, causing us to crash harder and faster than what was previously believed to be possible. Here's how I know this. Right now, according to the same stats Bill McBride uses, we have a housing inventory level of 3.3 months. The next report will likely show a new number of around 3.5. So using that, we go to Bill's chart and look across at 3.5. Historically, since 1999, there has never been a negative print in prices when inventory levels are at this point. But the case Schiller is already moving down. For the month of September, it was down 1%, and it's estimated that for the October number, it will be down around the same amount, if not worse. This means that the next print will create unbelievable outliers on this chart. All this to say that despite inventory levels appearing relatively low, we are seeing massive price drops on a national level. This has never before been seen and it's my theory that the market is moving so fast that these statistics captured by the Case-Shiller Index and the National Association of Realtors are failing to keep up and accurately measure what is happening on the ground. And if this type of downtrend is visible on the national level, we can imagine the carnage that is happening in these overinflated cities that we mentioned earlier. We saw from the last recession that in certain markets things can get much worse than is presented in national statistics. We are already seeing this unfold in countless markets that we went over today and as the flow of data continues we'll get a complete picture later on this year and hopefully understand just how bad this will get as always thank you guys for watching please make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed the video and if you're buying or selling in the seattle area i would love to hear what is happening on the ground in the comments below